Memorial, Memorial Day is not a holiday that should ever be overlooked. It should never be overlooked. It is a holiday in which we honor and remember those who have given the ultimate price for our freedom. Amen. I like to, on Memorial Day, I was actually jumping the gun last night. I had my headphones on, and I, I like to go to, there's a uh, famous Memorial Day speech that President Ronald Reagan made back in the 80s, and he, it, it's just inspiring. Uh, I like to show it to my kids to remind them what Memorial Day is about. It's not, it's not about just a day that we get off of work. It's about remembering those who gave everything. Not some, they gave it all. And so as you celebrate Memorial Day this Monday, get your family together and uh, remember those who paid the ultimate price for our freedom. Folks, our freedom, we still have it right now, but our freedom, it, it, there's coming a day where it's, it, it's in jeopardy right now. It's in jeopardy. The spirit of the Antichrist is already out and moving but I'm telling you, we need to be focused, laser focused on what God wants to do in these end times. Amen. 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 All right, I'm going to put the title of, the, of our message up on the screen today. It's simple. Choose your harvest. Choose your harvest. You know, you, we have the opportunity to choose our harvest. I want to give you the definition this morning for this word harvest. It's very simple. It's the time when you reap what you sow. The time when you reap what you sow. You know, that's a famous saying, oh, well, you're going to reap what you sow. That was taken from the word harvest, right? Sowing is the equivalent of planting seed. Do you hear me? When you sow, you go out into the dirt and you drop a seed in the ground. And you water it and you fertilize it and that plant begins to grow and hopefully it matures and it begins to fruit. Harvest is the time when you go out and you pick the fruit from the seed that you sowed. Are you hearing me this morning? So think about this title for a second. Choose your harvest. A seed goes in soil. It gets watered and fertilizes. It produces a fruit and then you get the fruit of what was sown. It is the time where you reap what you sow. I shared this last Sunday a few weeks ago. David Klinger came out to my house, plowed up a section of ground, and we planted a garden. The night before, my wife and I went and we picked out seeds. We picked out the seeds of what we wanted to harvest. You follow me? I don't eat broccoli. I don't like it. I didn't pick out no broccoli seeds because I don't want to harvest broccoli. I picked out seeds of what I want to harvest. I hand selected what harvest I wanted. And the harvest that I didn't want, I left it. I don't like you. Broccoli. So I'm not picking you. I don't want you in my house. I don't want you in my belly. Do you hear me? Now I'll take the green beans. I'll take the other stuff that we picked out because that's what I was choosing. Are you hearing me this morning? In the history of the world, in the history of the world, no human being 
has gone out into a garden, put their thumb in the ground, and planted an orange seed, and that orange tree popped up, and it started fruiting oranges, but they also noticed, oh, look here, there's a cucumber too. Can you believe this? It's also fruiting a, this orange tree also fruits cucumbers. That has never happened in the history of the world. The seed that is planted will only produce that which it is. We have the ability to choose our harvest. Now listen. I want you to get this this morning. This is very important that you see the analogy because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some scripture to you because Jesus talked and taught on a parable about a farmer who went out to sow seed. And I want you to see some things in this parable this morning. Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to start off by reading verses 1 through 9. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it. While all the people stood on the shore, then he told them many things in parables saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the paths, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred and sixty, or I'm sorry, a hundred, sixty and thirty times what was sown. He who has ears... Let him hear. Do you get this? He who has ears, let him hear. Now, Jesus explains this parable, but I want you to understand something. In this parable, the seed that is being sowed is the word of God. It is the message of God. The soil, this is important. I want you to see this. The soil that that seed fell on in this parable is the heart of man. We see this if we go forward a little bit in this parable to verse 18 and 19 as Jesus tells the, the meaning of it. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears a message about the kingdom and does not understand it, listen, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Okay? In this parable that Jesus was teaching, he is describing the heart of man as soil. Do you hear me? I have a pot up here that is filled with soil in it. This morning I about walked out the door without it. And I said, oh, I was walking out the door and I turned around and said, oh, I, I, I forgot my pot. <laughs> Erica said, that didn't sound right. It's not the kind that you smoke. It's this pot right here. It's filled with rich soil in it. I want you to understand and I want you to see this word picture this morning that our hearts are like soil. I want you to understand that there is seed that is deposited in our hearts throughout our lives. In the spirit realm, there is seed that is deposited into the soil of our hearts. Do you hear me? Jesus shows us very clearly in here that our hearts are like soil. 
There's no wonder Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says this, above all else, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Your heart, the soil of your heart needs to be guarded. It needs to be protected. It needs to be protected from corrupt seed being dropped and planted in your heart. Why does the word say above everything else protect your heart? Why does it say that? Because not only can good seed be deposited in our hearts, bad seed can also be deposited in our hearts. The enemy wants to come and deposit seed into the soil of our heart hoping that it will begin to grow just like good seed grows and produces good fruit. The enemy comes along and wants to stick his thumb in the soil of our heart and produce a seed of rejection and fear and hate and bitterness. And he's going to try and water it and fertilize it to where it begins to grow. Listen, listen to what the word tells us. Because not only does Jesus talk about the farmer who goes out to sow seed, which is the word of God, he also gives us a word picture about how the enemy goes about planting seed. Matthew chapter 13, still there, starting at verse 24. Then Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed, listen, good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? The scripture says that the enemy came. The enemy was the one who came and planted the seed of the weeds. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 30, 13 verse 39, he says, The enemy who sowed them is the devil. In the same way that good seed can be deposited in our hearts and can be matured and, and can be fertilized and watered and grow up and produce good fruit, love, joy, peace, kindness, long-suffering, gentleness, all of this, this fruit. The enemy also, according to the word, according to what Jesus says, the enemy also, the enemy and his devils are also wanting to plant seed into our soil. I was having a conversation with my son the other night. We were talking in his bedroom and I stood up and I went over to him and I laid my hand over his heart. And I said, God has called me to help you protect your heart. Protect your heart. Look at this word picture. We have, to, we have to guard this heart of ours. We have to guard it from, from the enemy wanting to come and deposit some filth. Deposit a, a, a seed that is not what God wants for us in our lives. Do you hear me? There are many ways that the devil plants seeds in our hearts. <coughs> Friday night, we had a big outreach plan here in the city of Bellevue. Got out there, got set up. Rain moved in, they canceled the event. We packed, they, they told us, there's lightning coming, you have to pack up and leave. So I was frustrated, I was mad. 
came back to the church, unloaded everything, and I went to my house. And I put on my headphones, and I was listening to worship music. And I was, in my mind, I was pondering and thinking about my notes of this message. While I was listening to this worship and pondering the notes of this message, the Lord showed me a vision, if you will, in my mind. What I'm going to share with you today, I know that I will stand before God and answer for it. So I do not say this lightly. This was a vision in my mind, not a vision with my eyes. It was a vision in my mind as I was pondering this message that the Lord gave me. I saw the enemy sneak up to a child and plant a seed of rejection in their heart. And I saw it sprout out of the dirt and it grew rapidly. So fast it could not be stopped. And in my mind I saw a massive, massive tree. Rejection written on it. And the Lord told me there will be someone in the service Sunday morning that the enemy planted a seed of rejection in their life when they were a child. But God wants you to know that you are not rejected by him. He has not rejected you. Others may have rejected you, but he has not rejected you. He has called you. He has anointed you. He has chosen you. And he is plucking rejection out of your heart. Amen. Today I want to focus on an area a specific way that the enemy plants bad seed in our hearts. There's a lot of ways that the enemy can plant seed in our life. Many ways is by things that we choose to do within ourselves. Today I want to talk about the eye gate and how the eyes, what we look at, is responsible for either planting good seed or bad seed into our hearts. Matthew chapter 6. I want to read verses 22 and 23. Jesus says, starting at verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. Everyone say that with me. The eye is the lamp of the body. Now listen to this. If your eyes are good, your whole body, everybody say the word whole. Your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Jesus tells us that what we look at with our eyes has the potential to bring light into our entire body or darkness into our entire body. What you and I choose to look at, what you and I choose to read, what you and I choose to watch has the potential to turn the whole body into light with good seed, but it also has the, it, the, the capability of corrupting the entire body. Fill your body with darkness. Moms and dads, we got to be vigilant with what we allow our sons and daughters to look at. 
We have to be vigilant. I, 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 it drives me crazy to hear of parents that will let their son or their daughter go in their bedroom, close the door with an iPad. The devil is saying, thank you very much. When an iPad replaces a human being as the babysitter, the devil slips in and he says, thank you, I will take this time to begin to deposit darkness into the body of your son or your daughter. When we give our sons and daughters unsupervised access to the, to the internet, that is a gift to the enemy. We didn't have the internet when I was growing up. Nope. Didn't have it. And I'm grateful. If we didn't know what a word meant, we had to get out a dictionary. We had to find it. You had to actually read something. You couldn't say, Alexa, Tell me what this word means. Or go to Google and Google it. You had to get out an encyclopedia. You had to go find the A through the B or the whatever and pull it out and open it up and read it. I'm not against the internet. It has made life easy, hasn't it? I'm not preaching against the internet. But I'm telling you the devil is using the internet to catastrophically destroy lives. To fill lives with darkness. To corrupt whole bodies. Devils love filth. They love filth. I read a book when my boys were growing up. They were younger. Actually, my wife made me read it. It's by Dr. James Dobson. It was a book called Bringing Up Boys. In this book, he talked about pornography. He talked about how one accidental view of pornography can get someone addicted immediately by the chemical that is released in the brain when they view it. The devil owns every pornographic website and the devil is after our, it used to be that pornography was a thing that only men and boys struggled with. That's not the case anymore. Women are struggling with pornography just as much as when, uh, men are struggling with pornography. But I'm telling you, the enemy is after, after getting people addicted to pornography. Why? Because when, when you sit in front of a screen and you view this, you are filling your body with darkness. There is Corrupt seed being deposited in your heart that will begin to grow and produce corrupt fruit. And that fruit is catastrophic. In this book, Dr. James Dobson said that they did a survey among evangelical ministers it was a confidential survey. And 40% of evangelical ministers admitted to be addicted to pornography. The devil's after our pulpits. Because when a man is staring and looking at pornography, he cannot stand up and preach with authority and boldness because his spirit is corrupt. You know what, men, you know what I'm talking about. There's not a man in here over the age of 15 that hadn't at some point in time in his life looked at pornography. Let's be honest. Now, now when you leave here today, you can, you can whisper to your wife, well, that wasn't me, honey. I, I ain't never done that before. 
All the other men did, but that wasn't me. I've never, I'm, okay? But as a Christ follower, when you choose to look at something like that, you get the catastrophic effect of it. The guilt, the shame, the unworthiness, right? What your eyes look at, you are choosing your harvest. You are choosing light or you are choosing darkness. When we open up the Bible and we read it, we are depositing good seed. We are depositing light. When we open up a, a inspirational, biblical-based book, it pours into us good things into our soil. We are choosing to read the Word of God. We are planting harvest, good harvest in us. But in the same way, you can choose to look at something that is not. You hear me talk about pornography a lot from this pulpit because it's not talked about from pulpits like it should be. It's an epidemic in our society today. It is rampant. The devil is using pornography to destroy marriages, to destroy uh, relationships with Christ. It has become so horrific. Most of you know my background at the sheriff's office. I was uh, a major crimes detective working in sex crimes. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you right now, listen to me very carefully. It is start, we are at the place right now in middle school where, where girls 11 and 12 years old are being pressured by boys to send nude photos of themselves. And if they don't do it, they don't feel like they're being accepted by, because why? Because all the other girls are doing it. Kids are sending, boys and girls are sending. It is happening every single day by people that you would not even think it is happening. It is rampant and it's starting at a young age. The enemy is after their eyes at a very young age. It is an epidemic. As much as I could try to articulate it to you, it cannot show you how real it is right now in our society. It's the tools that the enemy is using. Y'all know I've always been blunt, right? Can I just be blunt? Can we just be adults for a few minutes? When I was growing up, now this never happened, this never happened. I'm, I'm telling the truth. I'm using this example. When I was growing up, if a young man wanted to try to see a girl naked, he had to meet her somewhere or go over to her house when her daddy wasn't home or her mama wasn't there and try to convince her to take her clothes off. Nowadays, these little snotty-nosed punk jack wagon boys will get on their phones and they will find a girl and they will start telling her everything that she wants to hear. You're all, oh, you're so beautiful. You're all, oh, you're just so beautiful. You're just so great. You're just so awesome. I love you so much. You know, you know and, and listen, he's telling that to 15 other girls. Because what he's wanting to do is he's wanting to see something that he shouldn't be able to see. And before too long after hearing about how beautiful they are and they want to feel rejected, the next thing is, hey, can you send me a picture? That's what's happening. I'm telling you, that is what's happening. It is the enemy at work using the eye gate to fill our bodies with darkness. Darkness. If you are the parent 
of a teenage son or daughter or preteen, you need to be educating your children about this. I tell my daughter every day how beautiful she is. She ain't going to be fooled by some little punk out there saying, oh, you're so beautiful. She hears that from her daddy. Her daddy tells her how beautiful she is. Right, baby girl? And if I hear some guy telling her how beautiful he is, I'll give him a tune-up. I went to pick her up one day from uh, one of our uh, co-op programs, and, and this young man was walking beside her out to the car. And uh, it, it, it was actually a young man that I knew, but I said, hey, who was that walking there next to you? And she told me the name of this young man, good kid. And I said, well, tell him he's about to get slapped. <laughs> it was a joke. Parents, tell your daughters how beautiful she is. So she's not desiring that. Not only is the enemy using pornography, but he's using video games. When I was a kid growing up, you had Pitfall, Pac-Man, and Donkey Kong. That's all. And the graphics were so ridiculously terrible. But here we are in 2022 where there are video games that you can play where you can murder people. You can pillage. You can steal you can do perverted, horrible things and get rewarded for it. And our parents are letting them play games, not even knowing what's in it. Moms and dads, I've given you this resource before. I'm going to tell you again. There's a website that you can go into called PluggedIn.com. It will give you a full review of every movie that's out. Every video game that's out, it will tell you the content in it. If you don't take advantage of that resource, you should. My boys never liked that website. <laughs> because they would come occasionally and say, hey, can we go to this movie? And I'm telling you, as fast as she could, my wife would pull up PluggedIn.com. Nah, that ain't happening. <laughs> you ain't going to that. Why? Because we are trying to protect their hearts. We're trying to protect the enemy from depositing something into their heart. The enemy is using books, comic books, romance novels. These romance novels, can I talk about this for a minute? Because men are visually stimulated. Women don't usually want to see something. They want to read about something and, and let, it, let it churn their mind up. Get them all worked up. We had people that we knew that were reading these 50 shades of gray to m motivate them, if you will. This, this isn't funny. This is, this, th what you are reading and looking at plays a role in what seed is deposited in your heart, to the soil of your heart. Social media. You want to talk about seeds of rejection? Because nowadays our teenagers, their, their worthiness comes by how many likes they get or how many followers that they have, right? And they'll post a picture 
online to Instagram. And if they don't have X amount of likes within 15 minutes, they don't feel worthy. That's why we have young ladies today posting pictures of themselves half naked because they want to get as many likes as they can so they feel worthy. You hear what I'm saying? You don't have to show yourself half naked to be accepted. I'm just preaching truth this morning. You can be modest and still be accepted. You can walk in holiness and still be accepted. Am I preaching truth? There are people nowadays that spend the greater amount of time in their day on a phone doing this, scrolling. Let, let me ask you a question. How many of you have been scrolling through Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or any of these other popular social media platforms and you see something and it affects your spirit, either good or bad? How many have ever been there before? Hours, hours in a day. Hours. The enemy is after what our eyes are looking at. I want you to see this word picture of this pot of soil. As we go through our day, we have to guard it. We have to protect it. We got to be careful what we're looking at because what we're looking at has the ability to plant good or bad seed. We are living in a society right now that I don't care where you go, where, if it's to the grocery store, you say to yourself, my God, how did you walk out of the house like that? Amen. Amen. And half these people you want to say to yourself, why? My son came home from the beach the other day and he said, he says, dad, some of the bathing suits that these people are wearing. And he said, I wanted to tell him, you don't have it. It's been gone a long time. Years and years and years it's been gone. You ain't got it. And even if you do got it, it doesn't mean you have to show it. That shows you how far society has come and what people will wear, even to the grocery store. And I'm telling you, the devil is after your eyes. He's wanting to catch your attention. Let me talk to the men for a minute. Because... Most of the men in here, we've kind of trained ourselves. Especially when we're out somewhere with our wife. Oh, you got it down then, don't you? Someone walking in front of you with some shorts that are 20 sizes too short. Everything hanging out and you're doing this. What? Are we, are we going over here? Right? What? Hey, I'm going to go down here and look at the Kool-Aid. Right? We got ourselves trained like that. But what happens when you're out by yourself and your wife isn't with you watching your eyes? Are you still looking down the Kool-Aid aisle or are you doing this? <laughs> Seeds are being deposited.
Psalms 101 verse 3 says this, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. Nothing. No vile thing will I put in front of my eyes. Why? Because it's going to deposit a seed into my heart. Into the soil of my heart. Listen to what 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says. For everything in the world, cravings of sinful man, listen, the lust of his eyes and boasting of what he ha has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. Who's in charge of the world? The devil. He's the prince of the world. The scripture tells us very plainly, the lust of the eyes comes from the devil. Earlier in this message, and I'm getting ready to close, I read to you Proverbs chapter 4 that told us above all else to guard your eyes, right? So let's go back to Proverbs chapter 4, and I want to read verses 23 through 25. Proverbs chapter 4, and if the worship team will come on up and get in place. Proverbs chapter 4, and I'm going to reread verse 23, but we're also going to do 24 and 25. <clears throat> Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead Fix and gaze directly before you. It is talking about the connection of the heart and the eyes. Above all else, guard your heart. Guard what comes out of your mouth. And keep your eyes fixed straight ahead. Is this making sense? When I was growing up, I was a sports fanatic, still am. There was a couple of NBA basketball players that were very, very popular for blocking shots. There was one guy, his name was Matumbo. I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of him. But when someone would go in for a shot, he would swat it, and his go-to move was... Not in my house. Matumbo. And, and this was so popular. When I was a kid growing up, even my youth group, after church was over on Wednesday night, we had a full-size full, full size gymnasium. We would run full-court basketball. And, man, any time one of the fellows would block a shot, we'd swat it. We'd just wag the finger. No, no, not happening here. You know, in the spirit realm, we need to be like Matumbo with our, the soil of our heart. When the enemy comes to deposit something in our hearts, we need to swat it away and say, not in my house. Not in my house. I will fill my house, my heart, my soil with light, with goodness. We have the ability. At the beginning of this message, I talked about how Erica and I chose our harvest, we chose the seeds that we picked by what harvest we wanted. We had the same capability with our eyes. Have you ever noticed, and this, this, is, this is a battle in the spirit realm. It's a battle in the spirit realm. I've, I've said this before. Have you ever picked up your Bible and you started to read it and all of a sudden immediately you got tired? Or you, now, now that will happen if you're reading Leviticus. I get it, all right? But when you just, you, you really want to spend some time with God in the Word, and you, and you open up the Word, and, and you start reading, and you get tired. That's a spiritual attack. Because the enemy does not want you filling your soil with good seed. The enemy will come against us 
we know that the enemy does have the ability to affect our flesh. Doesn't he? But we have the ability with what we look at to choose our harvest. Choose what kind of seed is going inside of our heart. Choose what kind of seed is going to begin to grow. Stand with me, please. I want to ask the prayer team to come forward. I want to say this. If you just bow your heads and close your eyes. God knows my heart when I say this because I'm not trying to promote myself. God knows and I know that I'm not worthy and I'm not trying to promote myself. I'm just telling you. If some of the topics that I talk about bother you, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to sweep under the rug and avoid things that are epidemics in our culture and our society today just because maybe there are things that we list as taboo that should not be talked about from the pulpit. The pulpit is a place for truth. And every person who preaches from this house will preach truth. And they will discuss topics that many churches will not discuss. Because the devil has tried to keep the pulpit quiet and say, oh, don't, don't talk about this topic. It's not socially correct. And people are struggling and struggling and struggling, but it's never talked about. It's never presented from the pulpit. We are running out of time. We are in the last days. And every man or woman who stands in this pulpit is going to preach truth, and they're going to talk about topics that are relevant today. And it's not going to be hidden. Bow your heads with me, please. <clears throat> if you are here today, and you are the person that the Holy Spirit showed me on Friday night about this seed of rejection that was planted in your heart as a child. You didn't even know it at the time. You didn't know it. You didn't understand it and there's no way you could have because of your, your young age. Please don't leave here today without letting someone pray for you. And it may be multiple people. I don't know because the Holy Spirit did not show me who it was. I want to challenge us today from the pulpit all the way to the back door. I want to challenge all of us today to control what comes through our eye gate and to not allow anything to come through our eyes that is going to corrupt our bodies with darkness. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we repent right now for anything that we've allowed our eyes to look at that was unclean, unrighteous, uh, any books that we have read, anything that we have looked at, whether it be in public, private, wherever, we repent right now in the name of Jesus. We ask God that you would remove all darkness 
from our eyes, from our bodies, the things that we've allowed to come in through our eye gate. Would you remove it today, God? Would you clean us up? Would you change us? Would you, would you help us, Lord, to overcome and to be victor, victorious with what we look at with our eyes? Now, we want to pray this morning. And I'm going to throw this safety net out there. I want you to hear me on this. Just because you're coming down here for prayer this morning, it doesn't mean that it's because of your eyes or it's because you have a pornography addiction. or It might be, but I'm just saying, if you just want strength, if you want strength this morning... And you want the Holy Spirit to help you and protect your eyes, we want to pray for you. If you walked in here today and you're going through a valley right now, if you're struggling and it may not even have anything to do with your eyes, we want to pray with you. We want to allow the Lord to minister to you this morning and bring healing and soothness and, and, and victory in our lives. I'm going to pray a closing prayer. And at the end of this prayer, if you want prayer, I want, I want you to come out of your seat. Come down here. We will anoint you with oil. We will pray with you. If you don't want prayer, that will be the dismissal of our service. And I pray that you have a blessed and awesome family-filled vacation day on Monday as you celebrate the holiday. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today for meeting us in your house as we've worshipped you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I ask right now that your Holy Spirit would just begin and continue to speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would remove all pride from us, that we would not be ashamed to allow you to do work in our lives. Father, teach us as we roll out of our beds in the morning time and throughout the day to protect our eyes. I pray that you would go with all of us as we go our separate ways today, as families celebrate at the beach or the lake or getting together for cookouts or grill outs. Place a hedge of protection around all of us, God. Protect us as we drive. Protect us as we go to our families and spend time this week. Lord, just, just use us this upcoming week. Set up God appointments for us, I pray. As we leave here today, God, just surround us with your hedge of protection. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.